it's really, really wonderful to be here. I, I literally landed, the, my air, airplane landed just a couple hours ago. I was doing a, I was doing a keynote in uh, Washington State, in the, the top left you know, of the U.S., and uh, yeah, it took a red eye to get here because I was just so excited to be with you all. So thank you so much for letting us share a few ideas. Yeah, I think I'm still, I'm so energized, I think I'm still high. I think I'm still <laughs> up in the sky somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> you have to have a little fun, right? Part yeah. of this is being able yeah. to have some fun so everyone relax yeah. a little, right? Yes, totally. Yes. Absolutely. So yeah, we're, we're going to be sticking around for the next you know, while and the next uh, day or so, and we'd love to hang out with anybody uh, that we can um, as, as much as we can. Is relationship uh, building an energizer? It, you know, that's an interesting... No, it is for you. It is for me. It is for you. Not so much for me, but I will... Uh, um, but uh, I can reframe that. So, uh, Kent, I want to I wanna hear a little bit more about your work experience with StrengthScope. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you got uh, exposed to this assessment instrument and what you did with it at your last organization? Yeah, um, I think you exposed your StrengthScope instrument <laughs> to me. Uh, Josh, actually, he and I met, um, <laughs> just saying. It's good they get our sense of humor a little bit. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> we weren't quite sure how it was going to fly. Um, Josh and I met five-ish years ago um, as two parallel paths that we were on collided as he was working with a group of people in a movement called the Work Revolution and how do we really evolve the way we think about the future of business. And I was actively participating in a movement called Conscious Capitalism, which also similarly is looking at how do we take the system of capitalism and pivot in a way that it really is used to elevate humanity. Um, so we, we hit it off right away, and he actually introduced me to the organization where I had the opportunity to implement StrengthScope. Um, where I, I joined as their head of learning and development. And one of the first things that I wanted to do is really influence the language that leaders use to uh, resolve tensions that inevitably come up in an organization. And so what I found when I, when I um, having spent 25 years of taking tons of assessments and you know, hit and miss with them, but th this particular instrument I found is something that, um, if used really every day, in 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 the way I talk about it is in the way I've used it for the last four years as if it's a guitar tuner. I'm a musician. I play guitar and sing, and and in, invariably, as as we all go through our days. We're bumping into people, people are bumping into us, we're playing our, our jobs, we're, we're playing hard and we inevitably get out of tune. And so knowing energetically how to bring ourselves back to our most in tune state of being changes the way our thinking process, changes our language, changes our actions. And so this is how we really started to affect change and shift the culture in our organization is really looking at the language and how we, how that influences everything. And this tool really helps to influence the, the words we use and, and the way we engage in dialogue. Yeah. And so uh, Kent worked at a, a company called Lieberman Research Worldwide, LRW, which is uh, a market research company based in Los Angeles, California. And it's what, about 500? People? Yeah, five, six hundred people. Something like um, that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as, as part of uh, a leadership experience that we co-created yeah. together there, uh, that StrengthScope was embedded kind of at the, at the front end. Can you talk a little bit more yeah, about absolutely. how that, that this, connection worked? Yeah, so part of this, th this is how we introduced it to the organization, um, wanting to focus on leadership and the dialogue that happens from the top of the organization. Um, the, the course we designed is called the Emerging Leadership Experience because we're all moving into a, into a world that is changing more rapidly than any other time previously in human history. And so how do we learn how to lead through 
increasing amounts of volatility and uncertainty and complexity and ambiguity skillfully when we really don't know what's happening. Um, and so the, the, the first inquiry that we invited leaders to be in through this program was why do I get out of bed? What's my sense of purpose? Why do I choose to come work at this organization? Why does this call me forward? And if you haven't been in that inquiry before, here's a great time to do that. The second thing was, well, what energizes me and, and, and what might my batteries be made of as I'm getting up every day to head into my life, into my work? And so when we did this, it was a pilot program. I had no idea how this was gonna land in this organization. Um, we launched this within a month of me joining and the first group of 15 people that went through this pilot program, it was a six month program, all of them said, we can't wait for the rest of the organization to go through this program before we get strength scope out to our organizations. So the 15 leaders that were in that first pilot program, all of them said, do this with my team, do this with my team, do this with my team. So we had to pivot and our whole L&D team now has this whole assessment that is being asked by the leaders in our organization, this is really gonna help me, this is really gonna help my team. And, and that, that was a good sign. <laughs> we took that as fertile soil to do some good work. Yeah, and, and over the years got some pretty great feedback. I think even the, feedback. even the CEO of the company saying pretty stellar things about the program. Yeah, the CEO of the company, and he's been at this organization for over 30 years. Um, he took the company from when it was on the verge of bankruptcy, you know, doing about $5 million a year to $150 million company. And he said this program is, uh, is amazing because it's helping people become better human beings. And if our team and our function in the organization can help people become better human beings, good things will come from that. So, so it, was, it was really amazing to have that kind of, of buy-in and champion when, when my job was to say, oh gosh, all I have to do is help people become better versions of themselves. And here's an instrument that can help them understand their own unique energetic fingerprint and how to more prominently and skillfully offer that into the workplace and their lives. Yeah. Uh, so in... In the description for this session, I don't know if you, any, any of you all read it, uh, but we put out this idea that it feels like the world is in the largest change management project in the history of the universe with no end in sight. <laughs> right? Does this feel familiar to, to all of you? Um, what do you think is going on? Like, what is, what is happening? Yeah, so... It, uh that's a great question, and it's actually how I start a lot of my talks and presentations. I found this comic strip years ago as I was taking a little bit of a sabbatical from work to, just to get centered on and what contribution I want to make next through my, my life's work. And the, the, the comic strip said, the first square said, the history of man. The middle square has a cartoon picture of someone with a thought bubble that says, what the hell is happening? And the last square says, the end. That's it, that's all, you, that's all you need to know. So that's all you need to know. Like, we're really like, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Because it's all changing, like crazy changing out here. Because, you know, if you think about the technology advances that are going, we are living in a time of exponential change. And so, What's happening out here, do we want what's happening out here to dictate what happens in here? Or do we wanna learn how to exercise our own interior set of muscles that we have and understand our states, understand how emotions move through us, understand somatically, emotionally, as we begin to learn how to navigate our own interior and get ourselves to a point of able to be still and grounded and at our best in a world that is just swirling with all kinds of chaos, we have a much greater likelihood of skillfully navigating just the, can I curse? Shit show of change that's going on. 
can bleep that out later. Yeah, sorry. But really, like, so this is what I see in, in organizations as people move up and up and up and up and up. They get promoted because they're great individual contributors. Now I have to learn how to get results with and through other people. And every one of us is motivated and energized and makes meaning of that question, what the hell's happening? We all do this differently. And so I have to learn how to meet every single unique human being with compassion and grace and gratitude for their uniqueness. And I have to learn how to cultivate some unity. And so many leaders are just, we all have, there's this great work, sorry if I'm stealing the microphone. Keep going. Um, uh, Robert Keegan, who's the head of the developmental psychology department at Harvard University, um, does this great work um, and he talks about deliberately developmental organizations. And in that work, he puts forth the notion that we all, most people have a second job, full-time job that they're doing at work that no one's asked them to do and no one's getting paid to do. And that is to look good. And so we spend all this time trying to, to, just trying to look good and, and like it's the show. So if we can, as leaders, I, at lead, we have to set the container for allow people to drop all those artifices and, and charades and just come and bring their full self and their unique genius and learn how to leverage that. And it's, it's one of the most challenging skills that leaders can develop is to learn how to m manage their own interior and allow everyone else to do that. But that's like this, that's this upgraded operating system that we have to learn how to install and be with others in allowing them to be more at their best. That, that's the only way we're going to collectively get through this sweeping change of what's happening in information technology, in politics, in healthcare, and in all the systems that were born out of the industrialization of the world are all failing and they're all collapsing. And in this wake of massive change and evolution, we have to find some centering way to understand how we can skillfully navigate that at our best. And I think that this instrument is a hallmark, an incredible instrument that helps us learn how to do that. Yeah. Uh, and some, some research, yeah, drop, you should drop it. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was good. That was a good rant. Uh, I liked it. Um, some research that you all uh, may or may not have seen uh, from Deloitte over the last, and this is two, two different studies, uh, but uh, speak exactly, I think, to Kent's point, is uh, one, one of them shows is a study around passion in the workplace. Have you guys seen this? So you look at how many people are not passionate about their work, it's 87.7% <laughs> of people spend, them, spend their lives doing the majority of their time something that they are not passionate about doing, almost 90% of people. What, what is that? that? That's wrong. Yes. <laughs> and, the, and then the other, the other study that I think is really interesting that, that uh, came out uh, just last year uh, showed that uh, one of the top priorities of executives is to fundamentally redesign the organization itself. 92% of executives believe that the organization itself needs to be fundamentally reorganized. They just don't know how. They don't know how to do this. So this is something that we, we talk about a lot in, in the U.S. territory. Is, is the, does the strength scope approach, does an energy-based approach give us an insight into a new operating system? And so right now, the, the, the primary operating system of work, I would say, is fear-based. Right? Everything comes back to Fear. I'm afraid that you're not going to do your job, so I have to micromanage you. I'm afraid that you're, you're going to make a bad decision, so I can't trust you. Right? Everything comes, there's just so, and you guys, you know this, if you've been in any organization ever, right? It's just dripping with fear. And fear does not create innovation. It doesn't create uh, you know, collaboration, engagement. Engagement, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I think there's, to Ken's point, there's this operating system failure that's going on in the organizations that we see. So there's an organizational operating system that needs an upgrade. We need to move beyond this industrial way of thinking about people, move away from managers being our dominant operating system of work, 
And we believe that if we put energy at the center of a new operating system, both in an organization and at the center of your own operating system, like as, as a leader, as a person, if I start with energy, if I start with when I'm at my best, when I'm in my peak state of flow, then everything starts to make more sense. Put energy at the center and everything starts to make more sense. And it's almost like there's some sort of natural order precedent for putting energy at the center. Think about the solar the system. The sun. Think about the solar system. Yeah. Right? Like there's energy is at the center of everything. And, and yet, this is not the way we orient our organizations or our lives. It's, it's right now currently kind of an afterthought. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, that, no, th this fits really nicely into, and we do talk about this a lot among ourselves, and we talk about this a lot within our clients and within our tribe of practitioners that are growing in the U.S. Um, three simple words, be, do, and have. Has anyone heard this riff before? A couple people. So many times people start with, well, what do I want to have? Well, I want to have this outcome or this outcome or this outcome. Cool. What do I have to do in order to have that? And I do 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 to have and I do to have. And most of our conversations and organizations, if you're thinking about it, you're not doing this right. You're not working hard enough. You're not this and that. We, we're not having the results from you, so you have to do more of this. You have to do less of this. La, 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 la. And all the while, we never attend to the being question, like how I feel and how am I. And so we end up doing to have until we're burned out, until we're these stress balls, fear mongers, because like, we're just wrapped up in this do to have hamster wheel. If we can start with energy and it's like, as human beings, what is my state of being and how do I organize myself, my work, my life, my relationships that allow me to be Kent at his best and can I do things and make choices that reinforce this state of being so that I end up spending more time doing things that help me be more genuinely me and what I have, it's okay. Not to say we always get everything we're gonna get, we always want, but if we have a much greater likelihood again of having these results if we understand our way of being at our best and how do we create patterns and habits and commitments and decisions that reinforce that way of being. So one question that I tweeted last week, um, Josh and I were speaking in Florida last week. Does anyone know who Stephen Kotler is and Jamie Wheel? They, they are authors and study flow states. They've got a great new book out called Stealing Fire. They have a project called the Flow Genome Project and it's all about they study a lot of extreme athletes and how do we cultivate peak human performance through flow states. And the question that came to me recently is what if, what would happen if we were to organize companies around human flow versus cash flow? And the research that I've seen, so I tweeted this and I said, at Stephen Kotler. And then he befriended me on LinkedIn and I'm like, yes. Like, so how do, we, how do we all participate and how does language and our own internal dialogue and our own energy help us access these, these flow states more greatly? And the research that he's seen by McKinsey uh, state that if everyone in an organization were to be able to spend 20% more time in flow, organizational productivity would double. So for all those people out there that are currently organized around cash flow and EBITDA growth, we actually get better financial performance if we reorganize around human flow and helping people be their best and triaging work that way than we do if we're only focused on driving bucks or pounds or whatever currency. <laughs> So here's, a, I think, an important question for us to maybe kick around. But Kent, isn't work supposed to feel like work? <laughs> Aren't there just some crap jobs out there that people need to do? 
Yeah, there what, are. What do we what <laughs> What do we do with that? Like, how how do we approach the right? This is one of the most common kind of pushback things, right? So, what how how do we respond to this thought? Yeah, um, that's going to be unique to, to everyone, I think. And that is that is a that is a deeply ingrained, certainly in the U.S., um, a deeply ingrained belief and assumption that works just work. My CEO even said, um, if, if you're not spending 30 to 50% of your time at work doing stuff that you don't like doing, you're not. And I'm like, well, you're, you're insane. You're not, you're not working. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Um, so uh, again, I go back to, I think, whatever, whatever it is that we're up to, um, raising a family, being in relationship with our friends and community at our work, it can all be infused with our own internal essence and our own energy. So if that's clean, if that's clear, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm clear on that, so I use a lot, some language that I use a lot in, in an evolutionary or developmental context of life is we're all in this evolutionary process of continuing to wake up continuing to grow up, have more responsibility, and continuing to clean up. And as we do that, as we all go through this waking up, growing up, and cleaning up process, um, we learn how to put ourselves in this interior space such that what's going on out here doesn't matter so much and isn't as prominently influencing my states. Not to say that it doesn't influence and impact me, but I think that that retort to work is just work, that, that person hasn't quite yet maybe found their own inner harmony such that they can take that um, intention and take that quality out into the world in whatever it is they're up to. And it doesn't have to suck. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think this, is, this um, idea that work should feel like work is actually one of, one of the most terrible lies that... that uh, Gets, gets passed around because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. And so if you, if you believe work should feel like work, that's exactly what you're going to get. Exactly. Right. So I, I don't even remember who I, who I stole this phrase from, but uh, you get what you tolerate. Hmm. Right. You, and this, it's true in just about every area of life. You get what you tolerate. And so in, invariably we have these conversations with, with leaders, managers, you know, individual contributors all over the, the country. And invariably, this question comes up. And at the end of the day, it really is about this. How much do you want to work in an area that energizes you? How, how committed are you to reorienting your life and your work around that? Because it's, for strengthscope practitioners, it is not a mystery how to do that. Right? Our technology allows that to be a very simple answer. I know exactly what helps put you in that flow state yes. and what will derail you from that flow state. Right? That part's not a mystery. It's really just about how committed do we want to be to living in that state mm -hmm. as often as we possibly Absolutely. can. Absolutely. So, so to rephrase, like committed to being at your best. Life's hard. Life involves struggle. Brene Brown puts it this way. Like we are, as human beings, hardwired for struggle. And if you, um, I've studied some of the Buddhist tradition that talks about one of the noble truths is that life is suffering and life is hard. And so um, we, we're not proposing that if you take and use and practice with strength scope that life's all going to be unicorns and rainbows because it's not. Inevitably, you know, stuff happens that we have to learn how to navigate. And sometimes unicorns are mean. They are. They bite. <laughs> I got bit by one. Yeah, we digress. Um, what is, I keep going back to um, what gives us the best chance to skillfully face and navigate life as it comes at us. And that is putting ourselves in operating and getting organized and creating patterns, thought patterns, state patterns, emotional patterns. We're learning that we can influence these things. Um, and they're not just hard, hardwired, right? We can, yeah. we can, so that's this operating system that we're talking about. 
is learning how to exercise and influence the more subtle dimensions of our humanity to bring more stability and groundedness and generative, clean, renewable, reliable energy to move through the largest change management project that we've ever faced as a civilization. So yeah, I want to offer a couple thoughts on this human operating system idea here. This is one of the things that occurred to me the other day is we've been doing a lot of travel lately, and both of us actually have two little kids at home. And so I've really intensely recognized the finiteness of my energy over the last few years of having two little kids and then just kind of trying to build what we're trying to build. Um, <clears throat> And what I've, what I've realized is that, so the operating system that I'm running internally for my, my own person, that certain apps, certain activities that I run on my operating system drain my batteries a lot faster than other apps. Right? So this is just a metaphor you can, you can start to think about when we talk about the human operating system. Right? Certain things are going to drain my battery that maybe wouldn't necessarily drain Kent's batteries or yours. But my batteries are mine, and, my, and so I think this, is, this was just something that, that occurred to me the other night, is that, man, some, some of these apps that I run, some of the activities, when I'm doing them, I can keep going. Right? Like my battery lasts a lot longer. But then other things, man, they just suck my battery really fast. Right? So just a metaphor, again, to think about how do we start with energy? How do you put energy at the center of your human operating system? Because I think this is something we are just scratching the surface of in our organizational life, is how to appreciate and work with the immense variability that is human beings, right? So, yes, that's, we, sorry. We do I do that well. Please yeah, jump in. I was, uh, um, two, two interesting stories from this stop along my career. It was my first um, corporate VP job for a $14 billion uh, publicly held company in the United States. And my head of audit at this organization came up to me one day and he's like, Kent, I have a question for you. I'm like, awesome, Steve, what do you got? He said, how come every time I think I'm hiring a perfect employee, a human being shows up? God forbid. He had no idea, like, the prowess of that question. I'm like, what a great question. <laughs> like, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, Steve, and how are you going to meet this human being uniquely where they are rather than trying to make them a little mini-me, right, and have them conform to the way you like to work and the way you want them to be and shove them into that mold to be just like you? Maybe, maybe we need to talk about your capability as a leader, not this person who's a human being that you're sitting here like pointing the finger at now. Yeah. The other, the other story from that organization that really um, influenced me to go much more powerfully in this direction of this line of work is um, my boss at the time, who's a wonderful man, so this isn't a commentary about this person. Um, because this was the system that we lived in that was speaking through him. He said, Ken, I have some feedback for you. Um, when you're on the ninth floor with our CEO and our CFO, and uh, you, you really shouldn't smile so much. <laughs> because it makes you seem junior. Maturity is miserable. <laughs> I was like, what have I done to myself to put myself in this position where I've worked so hard to ascend to the corporate hierarchy and I'm being told, don't smile. You know, it's like, oh. Yeah. So, so bringing the humanity back into organizations is helping people understand who they are and how to bring the best part of themselves forward and play... Um, 
with other unique individuals. And another metaphor that we use a lot, if you don't like the computer metaphor, is like a, of a jazz ensemble. You've got great embodied musicians that know their instruments and understand how to play them with skillful means all the time. I don't want to play my instrument the same way Josh does. He doesn't want to play his instrument the same way Pam does or the same way Anissa does as part of our team. We all need to be our own instruments in this collective groove that we're laying down. All right, one, one more uh, closing thought here, which is kind of a, a rhetorical question that we've, we, we kicked around in preparation for this, is, you know, when can I get off this ride? You know, when, when are the changes going to stop? And uh, we would, uh, I think, suggest that that's actually the wrong question, right? That to suggest that the, ch that the changes are going to stop is kind of like suggesting that the waves should stop coming towards the shore. When, if that were to happen, we'd actually have a much more serious gravitational problem <laughs> on our, right? Like, so, so the changes aren't going to stop and, and just kind of recognizing that that's the case. And instead, maybe the more appropriate response is to figure out how to more skillfully ride the waves. As exactly right. In. Yeah. So we're out of time, yes? We're out right. of time. Very good. Well, thank, thank you all for, for hanging out with us and letting us uh, chat with you, and, and uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you so much.